Welcome. Before we begin, this video will have endgame spoilers for all three Xenoblade games within the first five minutes. You've been warned. Secondly, if you're familiar with the lore of the first two games and don't need a refresher, skip to the timestamp. And if not, continue watching. Many, many years ago, the people on Earth were facing a great calamity. Not from any natural disaster, nor from some alien race coming to invade, but simply from themselves. Humanity was battling against itself at a pace that would soon destroy the world. Much of the battle is triggered by a recent discovery, the Conduit. An artifact so limitless in its potential, it presented the possibility that our world was not the only one. That there were countless universes coexisting side by side, completely unaware of each other. Although the Conduit might just have had the power to let humanity access these foreign worlds. As with any major development in human history, people's opinions on it were extremely conflicted with some wanting to study it, seeing it as a gift from a higher power, while others saw it as far too powerful for human use, and wished to rid it from the world. For years it was studied in an international space station, but eventually they ran out of time. There was a rebel ambush from a group known as the Sabagites. Unprepared for the attack, the station was coming apart. Our story could well have ended here, the destruction of the human race caused by their very own hubris, but that was not the way it was fated to be, thanks to a single scientist, Klaus. A researcher on board the station, he had already lost hope in humanity after seeing their negative reaction to the conduit, and seized the chance that had been presented to him through this surprise attack, attempting to create a new universe with the help of the conduit, one free of the sins of man. Despite the protests of one of his colleagues, he went through with his plan, but things didn't quite go as he had hoped. Instead of creating a new universe, the world was split into two, one half of its essence successfully entering a new dimension, we'll call it Dimension B, and the other half, well, it stayed in its current dimension, being what was left of Earth after the destruction the conduit caused under activation, Universe A for the sake of this video. Klaus II was split, half of his body going to the new dimension and half staying behind to behold the destruction he caused on his very own planet. During the creation of the second universe, the extreme energy spike required to make the split caused two things. It destroyed virtually all of humanity that remained in universe A and launched both universes away from each other at astronomical speed, although not in any typical way. As millions of universes coexist right beside each other, the distance separating universe A and B only grew in the fourth dimension. These two universes were identical on the surface, but opposite in natures, and with neither world knowing of each other, they both went on towards their respective futures. Despite that, these two worlds yearned for each other, striving to reunite, but the initial explosion was powerful keeping them moving further apart for millions of years. In both dimensions Klaus had been split into, he had become a sort of god and became responsible for the new life on both planets. The half that stayed in the original dimension was able to witness the destruction he had caused and atoned for his sins, while the other half fell deeper into madness and caused chaos in the new world. As many of you know, these two worlds are where the first two games occurred. The first Xenoblade game takes place in Universe B, and Xenoblade 2 takes place in Universe A. We're not going to go in depth to what happened in these worlds, as this video will be focusing on the third game, not its predecessors. But what's important is that in both worlds, new life was created by Klaus, eventually developing into humans and other subspecies. And after millions of years, Klaus from Dimension B was killed by his creations, which caused the death of his other half as well. At that point, both worlds had just finished great wars and finally entered a time of peace. Dimension A had a female Gomati known as Nia for their world's queen, and Dimension B had Melia, the Hyentia, as their ruler. By now, a small Manelia had gone by since the two worlds split off, 
and the massive burst of energy that sent the two universes flying from each other had long worn off, and a second force, one of attraction, came into play. Through some unknown rule of astrophysics, even after being split into two different dimensions, these worlds seeked each other out, and, while only slowly at first, were making their way towards each other, faster and faster, with nothing slowing them down. If these two opposite worlds ever did connect, they would cancel each other out, ceasing to be, leaving only light. As the worlds approached, both queens eventually learnt of their predicament, and in quite the unenviable position, had to come up with a way to avoid certain disaster. To avoid mass panic, both queens refrained from informing their general populations of this calamity approaching them, and quickly got working on a solution. The first step was to establish communication with the opposing world. With the help of light, one of the few things both worlds had in common, they were eventually able to communicate with a different universe, breaking through the fourth dimension for the first time in history. While it certainly was a commendable feat, it was but a first step. They had a ways to go before they could do anything to save their people from imminent destruction. Only after many more years of research and collaboration, they were able to come up with a plausible solution. Through pooling their efforts, knowledge, and intelligence, the two worlds commenced the creation of Origin. It was to be a massive arc, storing all the world's information recorded in words of light. The molecular information of every rock, down to the very last DNA strand of every living person, both of the worlds were to create their half of the structure, and as the two worlds collided, the halves of origin would connect, and begin a process to reboot each world's states after intersection. Everything outside of origin would be obliterated, but then reborn exactly how it was, and with their momentum, the worlds would continue on in opposite directions for another manelium. The machine would have to be without error, even the slightest alteration in any of the information could cause the reboot of a world completely uninhabitable to life. I mean, they had things down to the force field origin would deploy while it generated an omnistatic space before the rebirth of both worlds. 300 days before the intersection, the queens finally had a moment to relax. After pooling in years of effort, it was starting to look like they might actually save themselves from calamity although there was still some unease. With such a unique circumstance, it's impossible to know if it will be a new beginning or everyone's demise. The only thing that'll show us is time. Satisfied with their accomplishment, the queens ventured confidently towards the future as the days till intersection drew near. Despite being on different planets, the two rulers were greeted to the same view as the worlds approached each other and both thought the same thoughts, wondering whether their plan would succeed, rebirthing them anew as if nothing happened, or if Origin would fail, and the two planets would simply crash into each other and disintegrate. No matter how certain they were in their plan, as they watched the other planet approach, nobody could go without being a little nervous, and that feeling of hesitancy, of wanting things to stay how they are, forever unchanging, is what doomed them all. Just as the worlds were mere seconds from colliding, we see Noah, our future protagonist as he looks into the sky and sees the other planet hurtling towards his own. But then time stopped, and Noah had but a mere few seconds to contemplate what was going on before the world as he knew it vanished. Something had gone horribly wrong. Origin's reboot process had failed, but not because of any mechanical failure, but rather an unknown force that was left unchecked. See, stored within Origin were the bodies and souls of every living person, that included their emotions. With their heightened potency during the final hour, where nobody knew if they would survive or face obliteration, the feeling of regret, uncertainty, and fear for the future was as high as it could be. And somehow, that emotion turned into energy, gathering within Origin. At first in a chaotic form, and then into a single entity who would come to call himself Z. 
Embodying the fear of an uncertain future in such a chaotic time, it laid but one choice in front of him, creating a world he could control. Within a quarter of a second, after Origin had begun to boot up in mere fractions before the two worlds collided, Zed came into being and froze time. Embodying the fear of the future that lives within every one of us, he searched to create the endless now, a world in which nothing would ever change, we would never have to fear the future, as things would never move forwards, staying constant forever. To bring this static world of his to fruition, he had access to all the information inside of Origin. The real problem was how he would keep his world going for the rest of eternity. Now bear with me here, it's about to get a little complicated. To bring any planet building plans into fruition, Zed would need one thing first the cooperation of the queens from both worlds. As the founders of Origin, they would be able to wield a hefty amount of power in the Origin-constructed world Zed planned to build. As a byproduct of being its creators, the queens also had a type of key inside of them, allowing them even greater influence over Origin. After he scanned their data, it was immediately apparent that these queens would not submit to Zed's regime, so he used force instead locking Queen Melia inside of Origin, using her as a key to unlock even more potential. Melia represented the fulcrum of Origin itself, and by using her as a focus, he could fully control all the data within Origin, even allowing him to access the memories stored within and bend them to his will. Life and death as his playthings. With this power, he could design his unending world. The first step was to create the land in which people would live on, which he did by reusing assets in Origin. It's important to remember that Zed couldn't actually create anything new. He could only recreate pre-existing things that had their data stored in Origin. After creating the land, then came its inhabitants, and this is where his ploy to keep the world running for the rest of eternity comes into play. Every living creature has ether inside of them, a type of life force which Zed could harvest from living creatures giving him power to keep his frozen world running. Now, he couldn't just harvest the life force of those stored on Origin, as even with two planets' populations on it, it would run out eventually. He had to get a little more creative, come up with a way to get the limited amount of life he had available to him lasting forever. Eventually, he came up with quite the grandiose plan. It started with gathering all the life stored within Origin and splitting them into two factions. All those who came from Universe A would be known as Agnes, and the other faction would be Keeves, all being from Universe B. Then, he would split them up against themselves, creating a war spanning the entire world. An eternal fight against each other for Zed's benefit. Now, this leads us to the same problem as before. Such a brutal war isn't sustainable for very long, in fact the world would die out even faster, so Zed created the cycle of rebirth. Whenever a soldier would die in battle, their soul would return to the queen of their faction and be reborn inside of growth chambers. Using powerful magic, the queens would accelerate their growth into young adults. Void of any of their past lives memories, these soldiers would be reborn into a world of fighting eventually dying again and repeating the cycle, with each death feeding Zed more power. To keep this system in place, Zed would need a few things though. A way to keep the two factions fighting forever, a way to keep people from questioning the world they lived in, a small but dedicated militia to help him keep things running, and the queens to convince their people to keep fighting and to perpetuate the cycle of rebirth. Let's start with how he would, let's say, motivated the two factions to fight. Both sides would be comprised of dozens of colonies, each colony being a massive machine that would come to be known as the Furanus. War machines capable of sustaining large groups of people and able to relocate at will. Each Furanus would be equipped with their own flame clock, a device that would feed off the life force of defeated enemies, but depleted with time. Everyone living in the colony would also be born with an iris, a device in their eye that would allow the sharing of information amongst allies, but also connecting them to their colony's flame clock, 
intertwining them in their lives. If ever a colony wasn't able to harvest enough life force from their enemies, their flame clock would slowly dwindle out, marking the demise of everyone connected to it. While the soldiers would be told that they were only alive thanks to the flame clock, in reality it was the opposite, serving no real purpose to them, only there to feed Zed and keep them shackled to this eternal war. The only way to free themselves from the flame clock was to destroy it, which would prove quite impossible as it was made from the same metal as Origin, quite indestructible against any man-made weapon. By forcing this reliance on their flame clocks, the soldiers from both sides would unknowingly become Zed's slaves, in a constant war to save themselves, without ever knowing that a hefty cut of the life force they were risking their lives for was going directly to Zed, so he could maintain his endless now. So far, this plan was all well and good, for Zed at least, but how would he keep the soldiers from either side from ever questioning their endless war? questioning the reality of this world. Firstly, he made sure every last person was born into fighting. There was incredibly little education other than how to take down the enemy. Nobody was taught to think, just to blindly accept who their foe was and to kill them, with subordination severely punished. From the start to the end of everyone's lives, they would fight, so it helped that their lives would be short. While the grand majority of people would die during the war, even those who showed extreme competency on the battlefield would never get the chance to live more than 10 years. Zed couldn't risk anyone living too long. If they did, they might come to see a comrade die and live long enough to see them reborn. This would risk someone piecing together the cycle of rebirth and maybe even lead them to discovering the real reason behind the war they all fought. To be sure this would never happen, Zed imposed a hard cap of 10 years to all those in the cycle of rebirth. Again, virtually all of them would die in the war well before making it to 10 years, but the few who made it would be celebrated as heroes and treated to the highest honor as a soldier, homecoming. Their souls freed from their bodies by their queen, released to the winds. Quite the pleasant death, all things considered, especially compared to what awaited them on the battlefield. This would serve as yet another motivator for soldiers to keep fighting, as well as a convenient way for Zed to get rid of anyone who overstayed their welcome. Those who would be released during homecoming wouldn't return into the cycle of rebirth, parting the universe forever. Only those who would die before their homecoming, which granted would be nearly everyone, were to be born again with a fresh slate. With people's memories being wiped after each rebirth, there wouldn't be nearly enough time to build up any kind of revolution against Zed, much less realize that there was even the need for one. Offseeing was another special process Zed created to ensure his war would continue eternal. Special soldiers would be designated as their army's offseer, staying behind in battle, only coming forth once the battle will have drawn to a close. Their job would be to put the spirits of the dead to rest, dissolving the husk of dead soldiers and releasing their spirits into the wind. Now, it's important to note that being off scene after death wouldn't be a requirement to be reborn in the cycle of rebirth. The only time being off scene actually affects someone's spirit is when it's done during homecoming with the queen, where when the soul is sent off, they'll never be able to come back again. While it may seem pointless then, it would certainly have its use. This war Zed created needed to go on for an eternity, but the husks of dead soldiers would quickly fill the land, not to mention that people would get incredibly suspicious if they ever found their own corpse in another life. With offseeing though, battlefields were wiped of their evidence as soon as they were finished, allowing Zed's world to stay eternal. It would double as a sort of morale boost for the soldiers, convinced into thinking that when they die, they won't be forgotten, Rather, their spirits would be sent into the sky to watch over their comrades from above. Now for many, that would be enough, but Zed was a cautious man. Wanting a last layer of security, he created a militia of Mobius. Each one would represent the same thing as Zed, embodying regret, a fear of the future, and a deep desire to keep this endless now going for eternity, with their irises replaced with the symbol for infinity, 
representing their eternal servitude to keep this world in its stasis. They would come to be known to the general population as consuls, and would serve as an elite guard that would keep the world running as Zed wished. They would infiltrate the higher ranks of both factions and act as commanders from the Queen. By doing so, they could control both sides of the war from the shadows, ensuring that everything would work out exactly how they pleased. They would gain their power through seething out energy from the colony's flame clocks and would be able to manipulate the mind of their subordinates through their irises, although anyone who broke out of their mind control wouldn't be able to be controlled again. These Mobius could also interlink, a process where two Mobius, both transfigured into greater forms, would merge, interlinking souls and unlocking even greater strength. So together they're like, ultra powerful. Exactly. Now, there would come to be two types of Mobius. Those Zed would make the moment he created the world, joining him from the very start as his right hand men, but Zed could also turn normal civilians into Mobius, reserving the ability to extend an invitation to anyone to become Mobius in the case he ever found a particular interest in them. If accepted, they would be flooded with memories of all their past lives and begin to serve Zed as his immortal servant all in the interests of keeping up the eternal stasis. These consuls would command both sides of the war and indulge in their fair share of life force, but while the Mobius were powerful, they had their weaknesses, and would still be bound by the rules of the world like anyone else. To be sure that his Mobius would crave the eternal now, Zed made it so if a consul ever did meet their demise, they were unable to ever re-enter the cycle of rebirth, making their deaths permanent. Now the last thing Zed needed to ensure that his eternity would go on without any hiccups was the support of the two queens responsible for building Origin, both useful as figureheads for their troops to unite around, as well as experienced magic users who would be able to help power the cycle of rebirth. But as we discussed earlier, that clearly wasn't going to happen. I mean, Zed already imprisoned one, and the other wasn't too much for this eternal war thing, especially one including her own people. So, once again, he had to improvise. While he may not have been able to get the original queens, robot replicas would do just as well, serving as morale boosters for the troops, and with a bit of extra life force siphoned off the colony's flame clocks, they were fed enough power to replicate the queen's abilities, powering the growth process of the cycle of rebirth. While the replicas were good, Zed still would have preferred the cooperation of the real queens, and so allowed Melia to perceive through the eyes of a simulacrum, thinking that, after seeing the hopelessness of her situation, she might abandon hope and join him. Now, for one reason or another, he wasn't able to capture Queen Nia, but with Melia's key giving him full control of origin and the world he would create with it, two armies blindly obeying the every command of the fake queens he controlled, and an elite squad of Mobius controlling the entire war from the sidelines, he wasn't too worried about what a single person could do against his power. Now, this seems like a whole lot of systems in place solely for the sake of gathering energy. Why didn't Zed just stick everyone into a giant prison, killing and reviving them whenever he needed the extra energy? Well, Zed may have originally been a carnal emotion taking form, he had now developed into a full person, he had thoughts, a personality, likes, dislikes, and desires, and what he truly desired was a show. Nothing got him more excited than the idea of the action-packed drama coming from war-torn lives, to which he and the rest of Mobius would be the eternal spectators of. At last, Zed's preparations for his new world were complete, and he conjured up his energy, as well as the information and origin and created a planet stuck in time, Ionios. He generated its own laws of the universe, the factions and the Furanuses they would live on, the fake queens and their subjects. Nobody knew how much time this took him, but why should it matter when he stopped time throughout the rest of the universe? After completing his world, he sat back and relaxed. With all the systems he had in place, there would be no need to participate in this new world of his fully content to simply be a member of this world's audience for the rest of time. 
He flew Orgen deep within the ocean in the middle of the world and surrounded it with an impenetrable vortex, all so he could be left undisturbed inside of Orgen's nucleus, undiscovered by all except the other Mobius, who would share his pleasures in being spectators of the eternal war. As Orgen came slamming down into the ocean, vestiges of its hard shell came off in re-entry, breaking off into the land, becoming one of the most precious metals in all the world, which will be important in a bit. So this was the world Zed had created, an infinite war he could enjoy watching forever, only ever occasionally stepping outside of Origin once every blue moon to offer a human a chance at becoming Mobius. Of course, there were a few things he couldn't plan for, one of these being annihilation events. See, Zed created the entire world from a special purple fog as a type of universal building block that could be molded into whatever he desired. This smoke had particles from both the universe A and B, so it could truly create anything from either world, so long as they had their information recorded in origin. Now, this purple smoke was a handy tool, but when it was unrefined and left to float around the world, it could cause devastating destruction. What would happen is that within these clouds of smoke, there was both energy originating from Universe A and Universe B, and occasionally that energy would separate, still in a chaotic form, but in two distinct groups. Just like the two planets, these opposites would attract each other, and in their chaotic state, would collide, cancel each other out, and cause a massive burst of energy, vaporizing everything in the nearby radius. While these explosions were always indicated by the presence of the purple fog, it could take centuries before one actually occurred. The real nuisance they caused was the disruption of radars, even clouding the vision of powerful Mobius due to their high level of chaotic particles from both universes. Now, what's been happening with Nia? As the true queen of one of these factions, she should be trying to stop Zed in his eternal war, and as a founder of Origin, she should have the power to fight back, right? Well, not quite. She was unable to get anywhere near Origin thanks to Zed riding it deep within the sea's vortex, so she only had a fraction of the power she could have had, but that's not to say she didn't have any. Nia also had a key to Origin, just like Melia, and with the help of the Origin pieces sparsely thrown around Ionius, she was able to create a weapon capable of combating Zed's power. Using some of the origin substract and the core crystal within her chest, she created a powerful device known as the Orbor Stones. While they were nothing special on their own, when activated, it turned the closest six people to it into Orboros, allowing them to merge a soul from Universe A and Universe B together, combining and redoubling their strength through an intense shared emotion. So together they're like... Yes, yes they are. When Keeves and Agnes came together in unity, they were a mere step away from the power of Amobius. That's not to say it didn't have its weakness. Two souls could only interlink for so long before their energy would become chaotic. Remain together any longer, and the two souls risked causing an annihilation event, killing everyone within a large radius. Secondly, there could only ever be six or boss alive at any point. To be sure, Zed couldn't simply use his power over the wall to shut down this interlinked form, Nia also made sure that the Orbos powers were external to the flow of the world, keeping them safe from Zed's control. Now, if Nia had walked by herself, an item that connected souls would have been pretty useless. Luckily for her, she still had some allies, seven powerful warriors that came to be known as the Founders. Their identities remain a mystery, and it's unclear whether Nia had to remind them the truth of the world, or if they were powerful enough to not have their memories wiped after Zed took over. So the intricacies of how they got together with Nia is a topic best saved to another video. But with the help of these founders, Nia's ore bore stones were put to use, and the founders wielded a great power. Unfortunately, even with their new Ouroboros forms, they were not nearly strong enough to top Z within his own world, and the Founders knew it. First, they had to create a weapon powerful enough to destroy the Flame Clocks, allowing them to free the people of Ionius from their eternal war for Light Force. Luckily for them, they managed to find some more pieces of origin that fell from the main body, and with the help of a mysterious blacksmith, 
created a divine sword. While it went by many names, the Sword of the End, the Sword of Origin, and Lucky Seven, its main attraction was its insane cutting potential, being able to slice through enemy weapons with ease, and even other origin metal, meaning it could destroy the flame cloths. Being made from origin metal, it also carried the wills of countless people. Whether the wielder protected the eternal now, or carved a path to the future, would be up to them. Knowing they couldn't skip straight to the final boss, the founders started small, going to minor colonies and destroying the flame clocks. It would teach the freed population the truth of the world and recruited those who wished to fight against said's tyranny, becoming known as the Lost Numbers. Even with their new recruits, they didn't have nearly enough force to wage an all-out war, so they built a secret city, grew their families, and continued their hit-and-run tactics. Their main goal was to steal growth modules from the two queens, and keep the pods in stasis forever. With fewer pawns on the battlefield, Zed would gain less power from deaths, and like that, the founders planned to slowly but surely, over hundreds of generations, weaken Zed's power. It was also discovered that those who were freed from their flame clocks could reproduce and have normal children. Even if the parent was still tied to their 10 year lifespans, their children were free of that restriction, allowing them to live full lives, although unable to ever be reborn into the cycle of rebirth. So the founders continued on, slowly building their might while weakening Zeds. Eventually, the founders grew old and passed away, but now they had an entire city of those who were fighting for the same cause. Nia created another Ouroboros stone, and with it, a new six Ouroboros were chosen, keeping the fight alive. The second Ouroboros crew included a tenacious Kavesi soldier known as Noah, and an Egnian fighter, Mio. Both freed from their flame clocks by the founders, and both chosen to be a part of the next Ouroboros crew. Despite being raised to hate each other, the two soldiers fell deeply in love, and turned out to have great compatibility with each other's Ouroboros form. While most of the Ouroboros crew wanted to continue stealing growth pods, Noah wanted to stop Zed in his lifetime. To minimize the suffering the people went through, he was willing to take on the weight of the world to end its cruel nature. Whether that makes him brave or foolish is up to you to decide, but after fighting all the way to Zed, he was defeated with ease. Mio was killed in front of his eyes, and he followed soon after. After many more cycles of rebirth of going through life as a Kavesi soldier, Noah was once again recruited by the Lost Ones, and once again chosen to be one of the Orbo's candidates, and as fate would have it, Mio was chosen as well. While they had no memory of their past connection, again they fell in love, and again they fought together to take down Zed, and again the same fate awaited them. The cycle continued, over and over and over again, with some twisted fate making sure that they were always brought back together just to be separated again. Yeah. At some point in this endless cycle, the current iteration of Noah decided he wouldn't fight Zed. He would leave someone else to become Ouroboros, instead focusing on his life with Mio, living with her, loving her, and becoming a family. While all the iterations of Noah had cared deeply about Mio, for one reason or another, this iteration cared to such an extent that he gave up fighting for the world's future just to be with her. But things were cut short. Mio had to wave goodbye to both Noah and their child as she was held back by the ten terms all those in the cycle of rebirth are subject to. Soon after, Noah too was forced from his child leaving him with but a few pouting wards before being taken away from his only son, disappearing from the world. Zed, watching from his seat in the audience, decided to kill two birds with one stone, and invited Noah to his theater, giving him a choice. He could either continue his endless cycle of despair, losing his precious Mio over and over again for the rest of eternity, or he could embrace the Endless Now, joining Zed as a Mobius. Of course Noah would never agree to this, 
While he may have not spent this life actively fighting Zed, he was still the sworn enemy of the Lost Numbers. Knowing this, Zed sweetened the deal and let Mio become Mobius as well, allowing Noah to be with her forever if he accepted Zed's offer. Wait, please. Noah was hesitant, but the promise of being with Mio was too great, and he accepted. As he became Mobius, his memories of past lives flooded through him, and he watched all the times they had loved each other, and all the times they had been separated. But he wasn't out of the woods yet. Before Zed brought Mio back, he needed to test Noah's loyalty, and had him destroy the city of the Lost Numbers, facing Noah with another choice. He could either destroy the city of his own descendants, or lose Mio once again, dooming them to repeat the cycle of despair forevermore. Faced with an impossible choice, he gathered his resolve and burnt the place to the ground, killing everyone who got in his way. His friends, those who trusted him, his family, none were safe from his rampage. Said, in his twisted ways, was sure to revive Mio just in time for her to see the aftermath of her beloved's massacre. But despite her anger at Noah's choice, she accepted that nothing could be done and they both joined Mobius' forces as N and M respectively, beginning their eternal lives together. Despite his actions being led by his love for Mio, or M as we'll be calling her now, she didn't approve of N's choice, and despite becoming Mobius along with Noah, she held on to that regret, so that when the time came where she'd be able to help overturn Zed, she'd be able to repent and help those who truly deserve it. She secretly began helping the Lost Numbers, aiding the few survivors of N's Rampage to rebuild a new city, one even Zed wouldn't be able to find. The city learnt from their mistakes and rebuilt better, safer, and much more hidden than the last time, with a new technology that covered their irises, making them impossible to track, even developing invisibility cloaks for their ships, only ever occasionally venturing out to collect the odd Ouroboros stone or to steal some growth modules. All other attacks on Zed and the other colonies were halted for the time being, as it would be a long time before they regained the power they had before N's rampage. Noticing that they would be in a deadlock for quite some time, Nia decided that she would go into a deep slumber. This way, she would be able to prolong her life even longer, so that when the Lost Ones had finally rebuilt their power enough to initiate a change, she would still be able to arise, ready to help. This also ensured that she would be safe from Zed's grasp, as if he ever captured the second queen, he would even have the power to take control of Ouroboros, dooming the lost numbers. In preparation for her hibernation, she had to do a few things first. She created as many Ouroboros stones as she could with the little power she had left, and spread them across the land. This way, the lost numbers would have a steady supply during her sleep. Then, she constructed Cloud Keep, a mechanical castle that would fly well out of Zed's sight during a slumber, and also contained some sort of device that fed her information from the world as she slept. Her last step was to confront M. Aware of her true nature, as someone against the Mobius, Nia gave M a pendant, which would serve as the key to unlocking Cloud Keep, and trusted her to hold on to it until the world was ripe for change, where she must give it to someone she trusts. With her preparations complete, Nia returned to Cloud Keep and fell into a deep slumber that would last an age. So, the endless war between Agnes and Keeves endured, and the Lost Numbers continued their rebellion from the shadows, when something incredible happened. Noah and Mio were both reborn in their respective colonies. Now, this shouldn't be possible, as they're still alive in their Mobius forms. And even if N and M had died, Mobius don't re-enter the cycle of rebirth after death. So, what happened? Well, when Noah was faced with Zed's two options, saving his city or staying with Mio, protecting the future or keeping things the same forever, it was such a hard choice that his soul was split in two. The part of his soul that feared the uncertainty of the future, wishing things to stay the same forever, were turned into Mobius while the part of him that had hope for the future split off, entering the cycle of rebirth and eventually being reborn as a new version of himself. The same thing happened with Mio. 
Such a powerful regret resided inside of her from becoming Mobius that her soul went through the same split, from Mobius side regretting the past and her other side searching for a way to secure a brighter future. As these other halves were reborn in their cycle, neither knew of their true origin, nor that a console shared the other half of their soul, so they followed the normal lives of a soldier. Nowadays, the Lost Numbers didn't really have the resources to free colonies, so Noah and Mia were never brought together by the Lost Numbers, and for generations continued their war-torn lives like anyone else. And finally, the iteration of Noah that we will follow for the rest of our story is born, the one who will finally be reunited with Mio and confront his other self. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I've split this video into two parts, not wanting to waste the time of those who have already played the game. This video comprises most of the complicated stuff, whereas the next video will be going through what you experience in the game, so it won't be as interesting for those who have already beaten it. If part 2 of this video is not displaying in the top corner, that means I'm still working on it, and it should be out, ideally, in less than 2 weeks. For those of you who aren't interested in that video, know that I'm planning to make more Xenoblade lore videos in the near future, so stick around the channel if you want to see when those come out. Thanks so much for watching.